Welcome back, everyone. Um, today we're going to be talking about the evolution of human beings, uh, primarily talking about um, uh, uh, our primate ancestors and sort of the early origins of that. Uh, again, a lot of this is going to be covered in your book, but I want to hit on a couple of key points that will move us into um, even like the rise of our genus of so one of the things that I want to point out is that um, a lot of people don't understand, again, evolution. And, I, and I've tried to hit evolution a lot just so that uh, you can come away with this class of a better understanding of this as a scientific principle, right? On the left, you have what a lot of people sort of, or the, excuse me, not the left, the top is what basically a lot of people think uh, like evolution is, right? It's just sort of one thing becomes another, right? A fish to a lizard to a cat to a you, right? That's not what it is, right? And and it's sort of like the family tree, right? Um, what you really see is that you share a common ancestor with certain animals, and the further in time that you go back, um, then the uh, more that you you uh, uh, kind of branch out on that tree, be it a family tree or of an, an evolutionary one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, what that's called, that little drawing there is called a clade, which is a group of organisms that share a common ancestor, right? Uh, and the, the cladogram is a drawing of that. So this is the clade of, cladogram of primates, right? Um, you see us there, uh, along with apes, because those are our nearest living relatives, such as bonobos and chimps and um, gorillas and orangutans and then further back you've got old world monkeys even further back you have new world monkeys and so this is why um, when people talk about uh, i know i've said before like oh well if we evolve from you know monkeys right why, then why are they still here well we didn't evolve from monkeys we share an ancestor with monkeys monkeys evolved from them as did we, right? Um, and so this is actually sort of a, a better way to think about the evolutionary model, right? And this is a cladogram, um, right, uh, that shows uh, um, all of the primates, right, a little bit more. Uh, it's tilted on its side, but it's the same thing. And so basically we're just going to be kind of walking along this top flight of stairs right there um, up to the, the genus of Homo. And we are talking about a pretty small slice of evolutionary history here. Um, you can take lots and lots of classes on this, but in the, the you know, four and a half billion years that Earth has been around, um, we are really just looking at, um, say, the last 40 million years or so. Right. So, uh, you know, we're not even going back as far as the dinosaurs. This is why I always joke about it. But, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll occasionally see an article that says anthropologists were shocked to discover a new dinosaur today. And I think, yeah, they must have been because we don't know shit about dinosaurs. So I bet it was real shocking to discover, to find out we discovered something important, right? We don't go back that far, right? Most of us don't even go back that far into the, even into the early origins. Of, of primates, it's a pretty specialized thing, right? Mostly we're focused on the last couple million years um, at the most, so yeah. Um, so we are talking about um, primates, right? There are old world primates and new world primates. Uh, not too hard of a concept. There's a, a primates is our order in our taxonomic um, tree. This is the order that we belong to. Um, it, there's actually a debate about how many primates there are, and I know that sounds odd the scientists can't agree on that but the truth is um sometimes you'll have variation between two different organisms and some people are going to argue well that's really one species um it's just kind of different versions of it it's different localized adaptation of it those kinds of things the way that you might see with um, um you know certain birds and things like that um whereas and other times uh, other scientists might look at that and say no those guys are so distinctive those two are so different from one another that um, we really ought to think of them as being um two separate species and so we say there's about 250 um that you know is probably the the the, the most agreed upon area um but there there's as i said those it's we call it lumpers versus splitters those that really want to kind of chop it up and say, no, these are different species, these are different species, and make it really fine. And others that are like, eh, they're like 99% the same, screw it, <laughs> let's just throw them in the same pile, you know. Um, and um, uh, uh, as I said, the, the very earliest uh, primates would go back to about 55 million years ago. 
um, and it's debatable even that far back, but these are basically the very first things that we can sort of point at and say that that's a, that is a primate-like creature, right? Um, so what is it that uh, makes a primate a primate? Okay, so there's a, a number of key traits, and this will be something that you that is a main theme as we're talking about biological anthropology and human evolution. Um, the first is brain, right? If there is one super important, really distinctive thing about primates, it's our brain, right? Our brain to body ratio is much, much higher. Our brain um, is much more complex, right? It's not, as I've mentioned before, it's not just the size of brain doesn't matter. What matters is specialization of particular areas in the brain so that they have sort of dedicated um, things that they do, right? Um, and, and, and we certainly have that. Another is that uh, with with going along with brain and sort of head and everything is that we have less forward prognation and forward prognation refers to think of a dog and what we might call like a snout or a muzzle. Right. Um, the fact is, our jaw and our teeth don't sort of come out, you know, as as far as like a lot of animals do. Um, and as you go up the evolutionary sequence for us, you see that that becomes less and less pronounced, that our, our, our jaws and stuff um, have gotten smaller and, and our teeth have gotten smaller. Um, um, uh, those kinds of things, right? Um, we've gotten better vision and we've gotten worse smell. Now, I want to talk about like why some of this is. There's a lot of debate about the evolutionary history that caused this to happen. As we talked about, natural selection is something that's going to cause an organism to change. So what natural selective pressure was out there that led us to um, get a bigger brain, that led us to, um, you know, get smaller teeth, to get smaller jaws? I'll show you some some illustrations of this later on, right? Um, a lot of people actually argue that this may have been um, something that it was certainly happening before, um, but by the time that we started walking upright, we were we started to access an, a whole new food source, right? And, and that is through hunting and through scavenging. We started going after game, and the protein that was in that uh, that food source becomes super critical for human beings because. We, while, while this brain is really impressive, it's also a gas hog. Uh, our brain uses up more energy in our bodies than any other organ. Um, it takes a hell of a lot to fuel this thing, right? We are, we're like the Chevy Suburban of, of, of mammals in a lot of ways. We need a lot of calories for what we are, and we need really dense calories, right? Um, the forward prognation and everything, uh, we argue that it's probably because since we started accessing newer, softer foods and things like that, right? Um, better vision may also have been uh, something related to us becoming bipedal and starting to hunt more um, as it becomes, you know, our dominant sensory organ, right, um, is vision. And, um, you know, we are binocular stereoscopic, meaning that we have two lenses, but only one image. This probably has a, a, a much deeper root in our evolutionary history. Um, we do know that our, our some of our earliest ancestors were fruitivores. They lived on fruit. And so they probably developed uh, like color vision so that they could look at fruits in the canopy and see what was ripe and not. That's the best way to decide if fruit is good. And so um, it probably started with that. The binocular stereoscopic thing, one of the most important things about that is that it gives us depth perception. And depth perception is really, really important when, like our ancestors, you're arboreal and you live up in the trees. You're swinging from tree branch to tree branch and you need to have really good depth perception so that you don't miss it and fall 60 feet out of the, the you know, jungle canopy. That's, that is bad for your evolutionary fitness um, to leave a little person-shaped crater on the ground. Um, so there's, there's things that are sort of probably that go along with that, right? Um, and building on that of us being in the treetops is uh, the pentadactylism, right? Um, we have five five fingers, right? That's that's pretty much what you see um, with uh, all of the primates, right? You, we have flat nails and not claws. Um, that's almost all of them, at least on some fingers. That's true. There's one or two primates. <coughs> excuse me. There's one or two primates that do have like a claw on their basically what we would call their pinky. They've got a claw on that and the rest are these flat nails. Most primates have completely flat nails on all of their fingers, right? 
Um, we also have an opposable thumb, which on we have the most flexible. We as human beings have the most flexible thumb, but all of us do. And again, this is because we were um, swinging through the treetops and we were climbing and we were descending and doing all of this kind of stuff. And so we needed to have this very versatile hand, but it, it comes into play later on as we're going to talk about, right? Another common, uh, at least for humans, uh, another common thing is that we have an incredible amount of uh, flexibility in our shoulders and our hips, okay? Um, overhand movement is very high, right? We can do this and, and really rotate our arms back, me less so now as I've gotten older, but our hips are, are really, really flexible as well, and um, which often means that at least uh, for in, in, in the apes and in almost all the monkeys that I'm aware of, um, it, bipedalism is often at least possible. Uh, it's pretty rare for a primate to have no bipedalism whatsoever. Again, this will become really critical with human beings, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, overall, you can say that most are arboreal. We clearly are not. We are terrestrial animals. Arboreal means that you live in the trees. Terrestrial means you live on the ground. We are a terrestrial primate, but that's actually kind of rare. Most of them are arboreal. Um, almost all of them, other than a few out of these 250, are very social. They live in um, social groups that have... Uh, complex social hierarchies and things like that. Um, and then um, uh, they are diurnal, which means that they are awake during the day as opposed to nocturnal being awake at night. Again, that's almost all of them, not all of them, all of them. There are a few nocturnal primates, but as a general trend, you can, you can say that's true. Now, we're going to work our way up uh, through these different groups. Uh, and our, as I mentioned, our prim primates is our order. Our suborder is the Strepsirrhini, and the suborder Strepsirrhini is kind of moist, hairless noses, right? Um, um, uh, old world monkeys, lower primates, things like that, they are arboreal. These tend to be nocturnal, and they tend to be omnivores as well. Now, uh, I'm going to talk about another group here in just a second, but you'll notice with the tarsiers, who uh, everybody kind of loves, they're these really super cute critters that live in trees, they have super long tails and these ginormous eyes, they're adorable. Um, we, we, the truth is, a lot of the traits that I was just talking about, I'm going to talk about Strepsirhini and Haplorhini, the two suborders in the primate family, uh, or in the primate order. Um, Tarsiers actually have a blend of both, <laughs> and so depending on the book that you read, you will be told that they're Strepsirhini or Haplorhini. And I bring this up not because I'm trying to emphasize um, how we don't agree, but I'm trying to emphasize the fact that science is a, uh, a messy process. Science is a, a process that is imperfect um, by nature. Um, and, and that when we don't know something, it's kind of, that's the important time, right? Um, we don't quite know where to put these guys, right? I think that your book puts them in Strepsirhini, not Haplorhini, if I remember correctly. But nonetheless, um, these blended traits, they demonstrate that as, as scientists, we continue to work through things. We continue to revise things. We continue to add new information. Um, there's recently been a little bit of work that's been done on the uh, the genetics of this animal um, as we've gotten that as an option. And I'm, I'm not quite sure the direction that that's all gone. But nonetheless, as I said, I bring this up because um, you'll see that, you know, you'll see scientists say, well, we don't know. And we're working on that. But that's the power of science is that we can say we don't know. I'm working on that. Right. Um, and so these guys are a, a very cute reminder of that in science. Uh, as I said, there's uh, uh, Haplorhini is actually the suborder that we belong to, right? Um, but it is the other one in, in the order of primates, about 145 species, 90% are monkeys. Um, they have larger eyes and they are more reliant on eyesight and they typically have a larger brain as well. So Haplorhini is what we belong to, so we're going to kind of go off on that little offshoot. Um, Haplorhini is divided into two, what's called parv orders, right, which is platyrhini and catarhini. Uh, these get confusing, I know. Um, the platyrhini are new world monkeys, catarhini are old world monkeys. So um, new world monkeys have this very wide septum, like this little spot in the middle of your nose that separates your nostrils. It tends to be very, very wide on the new world monkeys. 
they have a dental formula. And a dental formula is um, just the idea that when you're counting up the teeth of an animal, um, primates are bilaterally symmetrical, which means that if you draw a line down the middle of us, the left side is identical to the right side, right? It's a mirror image, I should say. If you do that with the teeth, that's also true. And so if you sort of imagine a mouth opened all the way and drew a line through the middle and a line um, straight across and then down the middle, you'd end up with these four quadrants. And in that, um, you can then call a particular dental formula of incisors, canines, premolars, and molars. In old world, or excuse me, in new world monkeys, it's 2132 two or 2133, three, meaning there are two incisors one canine, three premolars, and two molars, or in some cases, three molars. If you look across at um, the dental formula for old world monkeys, um, you will see that it's a two, one, two, three dental formula. So two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars, right? Well, that's what we belong to, right? And I'll come back to that in a second. Another thing that's really common uh, in uh, platyrrhini that you don't see in catarrhini is prehensile tails. Um, is the uh, prehensile tail is a tail that almost is like a third hand. It allows um, uh, sort of new world monkeys when they're climbing around the trees and stuff. It gives them an extra way to hold on. It, it allows them to grasp things. Um, many can even just like fully hang from it. Uh, I will also tell you that uh, as long as you bear that in mind, it will ruin tons of movies for you because it's a hell of a lot cheaper to film a, a, a jungle scene uh, in say Mexico or Central America than it is Africa a lot of times. And so I've seen tons of movies that are supposedly taking place in Africa or in Southeast Asia or something. And um, there's all of these new world prehensile tailed monkeys running around, right? Uh, um, and as I said, most of them are arboreal, um, but pretty much almost all of them, right? Now let's talk about old world monkeys, our par of order, right? We have a narrow septum, as you can kind of see on yourself, right? That gap between your nostrils. We have a two, one, two, three dental formula. And to demonstrate another aspect of evolution as it's taking place, um, were we in the classroom, I would ask it, you guys if you had your wisdom teeth. And in every one of my classes, of course, there's lots of people like me that don't have their wisdom teeth because a very nice guy took them out of my face when I was about 17. Um, however, a lot of people now, more and more in almost all of my classes, I'll have a student that never got wisdom teeth no one took them out and they're not there. The reason for that is that as we continue to evolve, and yes, we are continuing to evolve, we are losing our wisdom teeth. That third molar um, isn't always there. There's a lot of people that are a two, one, two, two dental formula. Um, this is because as we continue to evolve, um, I mentioned before that uh, over the course of our evolutionary sequence, our jaws have gotten smaller, our teeth have gotten smaller, uh, all of that, and there's less room. That's that's why you have this problem with your wisdom teeth, like I did, where they're coming in all these crazy angles. There's not enough room for them. It was messing up my other teeth. Um, I'm sure many of you have the same thing, and so they had to be removed by a doctor, right, by a dentist. Um, that's happening because we're evolving right and yet we continue to evolve which is why more and more people have several friends um, who just don't have them they just never came in right um, and so uh, uh, um, that's a, a neat way that we see that still right um, old world monkeys also not all of them obviously but some of them have what's called an ischial callosities uh, ischial callosity is also called a rump pad basically it's a smooth hairless um, um, pad on the butt um, that's pretty rough um, that doesn't have as many nerve endings in it. And the reason for this is another uh, one of those cool evolutionary things. Um, Catarrhini are much more likely to be terrestrial, meaning hanging out on the ground. Well, if I asked you guys to like squat and just sit on like, you know, your heels or sit on the ground with your feet on the ground, after 10 or 20 or 50 minutes or whatever, and I told you, all right, jump up really quick, right? Many of you'd be like, hold on a minute, man. I'm gonna need a, I'm gonna need a minute to get up here, right? Why? Because, you know, my butt's asleep, my legs are asleep. I'm, I got pens and needles. It's gonna take me a second to stand up properly, right? 
Well, that's all well and good for you and I, but if you are living in the jungle or on the savanna and a lion walks up on you, you can't be like, hold on one second, man. Let me just like get up. It'll just, just give me a minute. Hold on. Right. That doesn't work. Right. And so what this does is it's an evolutionary adaptation to that demonstrates that these organisms are more terrestrial, which we also know from observation. But it demonstrates the biology of this, that their lifestyle um, has selected for this because evolutionarily the animals that had a hard time and like their leg fell asleep and stuff like that, they got eaten. But the ones that had a thicker rump that didn't have as many nerve endings and blood vessels and stuff like that in there were able to just jump up and run as soon as the lion shows up right so that's part of it too um another thing that you see in catarini is sexual swelling um which is when a female in these species um is an estrus she's um capable of mating then her genitals will actually get engorged with blood and they swell up and they turn bright red this may be one of the reasons that we also have color vision besides fruit um, is that it was this sign to the other males, um, you see this in, in chimpanzees, for example, that, uh, that this female is sexually re re receptive, and then all of the males will come over to her and sort of crowd around and, and all of that kind of stuff, right? So, um, so that's uh, uh, also something that's common. That actually does happen in human females uh, to a lesser degree, and it's also not something you notice probably because, you know, we wear pants. Um, but it happens in, in pretty much all of them that I know of. So uh, this is the, the difference here that I was talking about with those nostrils, right? The, the, the old world, or excuse me, the new world monkeys with this large distance on the left um, of, of a septum, whereas on the right, you see some old world monkeys that have that very, very narrow thing. There are some other things about the zygomatic arch, uh, the ear tubes, things like that. Um, but those are the kind of big ones. So let's talk about um, our super family, right, which is uh, hominidia, uh, which uh, is uh, the great apes, right? There are no, no monkeys in this, this part. Uh, there's no monkeys in this club, right? We cut them off. Um, so there are the, both the greater and lesser apes are found within this group, right? Um, which in, uh, the, the greater apes is like the, the four on the right, you see human through orangutan. Gibbons are actually lesser apes. You can see that there is a serious difference between the, the size uh, and stuff of, of many of these, uh, uh, from the, the lesser to the greater there, um, just in terms of, of just mass, right? Um, and hominidia is our family, which is only the great apes, right? Um, and so this is only um, those few animals. So let's talk about some key evolutionary things here. Um, one of the things that I want to point out is, is, as I said, right, at the very beginning of this, I said brains. Brains matter for primates, all primates. I don't just want to talk about humans. Uh, that's what I'm obviously going to be focused on because I'm an anthropologist. But in all of the primates, you're seeing a much larger brain compared to many of the, the our sort of mammal kin um, that is out there. Other mammals outside of our order, they tend to have much, much smaller brains than anything within our order, again, to body size ratio. If you look um, at the top there, you can see this very clear evolutionary progression. Chimpanzees, uh, again, are our are, are nearest living relative. Um, Artipithecus, which is an extinct uh, organism now, barely has a bigger brain size. Australopithecines, barely a bigger brain size, right? Uh, they were both upright walkers, but in many ways were not that different from chimps or the ancestors that we shared from ch with chimps, right? Um, moving into our genus, though, you, of Homo, you see this massive jump in brain size with Homo erectus and then ultimately to Homo sapiens, right? Um, as I said, size isn't the only thing that matters. It's about brain complexity, but that complexity often has a, a concomitant increase in size with it, right? Um, <clears throat> the chimpanzees are quadrupeds. And then again, you see this evolutionary sequence into bipedalism, right? Um, 
and then with teeth right you can see that our teeth are getting smaller and smaller over time our canines are becoming less pronounced over time right um we arboreal our chimps were arboreal uh, artipithecus probably was too the australopithecines may have been some um but um you know kind of mixed their time and then once you get to our genus it's pretty rare to be finding tree dwelling um you know homos right so what does all this mean how do we put all of this together um what caused this change one of the important things to understand is the change that we see in the environment at the time uh where we start to sort of branch off from chimpanzees there was a lot of climate change that was going on at this time the world was becoming um warmer and drier <coughs> excuse me i misspoke cooler and drier <clears throat> But that loss of moisture led to uh, a, a lot of desertification and a lot of areas that had previously been forest were no longer forest. They were slowly turning into savannas and grasslands, right? And our ancestors lived in those areas, right? And so uh, we had probably been uh, arboreal as, as our, our ancestors were. And we, you know, we know that our, uh, most of our living cousins were, are um but as the world became drier right as these trees died off as it turned into a grassland it's hard to swing from tree to tree when there aren't many trees around and so there became an evolutionary benefit to being able to walk around on two feet now it's not like that just came out of nowhere as i mentioned we had these really flexible hips and shoulders already to climb and swing through trees and stuff and so there was already an evolutionary sort of predisposition to this right but then there becomes this real immediate benefit that any of any of our ancestor groups those in the group that were capable of walking upright bipedalism um suddenly had a huge advantage to those that weren't as good at it and so evolutionary changes that maybe you know uh, again mutation causes different things people that had uh, organisms that had maybe a slightly different uh, uh hip socket and things like that suddenly have a huge advantage over those that don't right um likewise one of the important things we realized is that once we started walking upright it did something really cool it freed our hands we no longer need this for climbing or running or grasping or things like that that say chimps still do gorillas still do you know most of the monkeys still do um that meant that we could manipulate objects this is why we became the dominant species on the planet we can manipulate objects we can create tools we can carry things we can tote stuff right um and ultimately once we get a little bit more refined we can hunt because i can make tools which means that i can make spears and i can make bows and i can make arrows and i can make all these different things with, with my hands and i have this incredible vision that allows me to do it right again not that we evolved vision to be hunters um we evolved it to swing around in the trees but a benefit was we had this great depth perception and so you see these videos of individuals that um you know live in a forager society and they can throw a spear um or or shoot an arrow with insane accuracy over very long distances right some of you even may do archery or hunt with a bow or things like that and so uh this gave us this incredible ability right and um, once those two things kind of synced up with each other that's when we see starting with our genus the really drastic decrease in tooth size and it turns out that this was also something that was um, caused by our behavior as we started to hunt we had this food source we weren't eating these really tough fibrous like roots and nuts um, and leaves and stuff anymore we had something that was a lot softer meat um, that we were able to eat that we were acquiring with great frequency that was fueling this brain size growth right um if you you look at at um medical texts and stuff as i said our brain requires most of our energy when you look at children under the age of five and how much energy is actually going into their brain it's absolutely insane um it's a tremendous tremendous amount of of um, energy that is being put into um brain production and brain growth even way way higher than it is uh in adulthood 
And so this was a really important source of needed nutrients um, for our development and growth, right? Um, and, uh, and as we were getting this, right, our teeth start getting smaller, our jaws start getting smaller, um, these kinds of things. Now, um, with that, you also see these other changes like the loss of a sagittal crest. Uh, this is a Paranthropus. Paranthropus was one of our very earliest, earliest kind of cousins. Um, we are not directly descended from Paranthropus, um, but I'll, I'll show you on the kind of evolutionary map uh, where they live. But what probably stands out to you most here, right, is one, this forward prognition. We don't have the jaw for this guy, but you can see um, sort of what would be his upper lip or something, uh, you know, underneath his nose really jutting out. And so you can see that he had that prognition that I was talking about, right? Um, and uh, without a doubt, we have jaws of other uh, members of this genus. Um, but you'll also, the, the probably the big thing that stands out is that big fin on the top of his head. He looks like a 1950s automobile. That's called a sagittal crest. And the reason for that is actually to have uh, muscle attachment to the bone. We do still have a little bit of a sagittal crest, some of us more than others, some of us are a little less evolved, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, we still do have that a little bit, but not by much. The reason for that is that the jaw is only attached to the skull through like muscle and tendon, right? Um, and so um, you can kind of feel this if you tighten your jaw, right? You'll feel it in your cheeks right here, this muscle. But even all the way up here in your temples, if you tighten your jaw up and bite down, you can feel muscles clench because there are muscles that come out of your jaw and wrap all the way up around your head. Now, what we have come to realize is that the more fibrous the material that you're eating, right? And this goes for all organisms the bigger your jaw has to be and the bigger those muscles have to be just to work that stuff, right? And so a lot of times, even though it looks terrifying, these, these organisms that are vegetarian are the ones that have these huge teeth and they have huge jaws and they have all of this stuff, right? Uh, and so even though we don't have the jaw on this guy, we know that it was absolutely massive. Um, if for no other reason than that sagittal crest because his jaw was so big he needed extra attachment places on top of his head because those huge muscles had to do something. And so they wrapped up and attached to that sagittal crest on top of his cranium. Um, and so, so we can see, you know, oh yeah, we, it's pretty easy for us to tell exactly what this guy was eating. Now, one of the things that's important here too is that I'm saying we've got this new food source, but there's a real critical ingredient here that we would have needed um, to uh, uh, access that food source, not just walking upright, not just making spears, not just having good vision, but that's fire. Fire is really, really critical. Um, and uh, as the, the, this one uh, great anthropologist, uh, uh, Ringham, uh, wrote this book, Catching Fire, and as he says, how cooking made us human. His argument is, cooking made us people but in that sense that by cooking our food cooking does a lot of things to food um it it makes it safer to eat right to, to whether whatever the food is mushrooms um you know leaves whatever it kills bacteria especially on meat especially on meat that really critical source of protein and omega-3s and all the rest of that that we started getting when we were eating other animals um but it, it literally made us human he argues because um without that we never would have been able to unlock that a lot of the things in meat despite what the um, the raw movement in food would have you believe actually cooking things. Um, it breaks down the fibers in what you're eating and it makes more of it bioavailable. And so if you ate something raw, uh, not overcooked, I'm not talking about burning shit, but like if it's cooked, a lot of times if you ate something raw, you can't digest all of the stuff in there. Um, because your body can't break it down enough to access it. Whereas if you cook it, the fire breaks it down for you, right? Um, it's sort of a pre-digestion, right? It breaks it down so that when you eat it, you're able to extract those nutrients out of there. Um, it, it also does different things with various proteins and compounds and stuff like that. Uh, we also know that uh, cooked food is um, 
uh, among primates is greatly preferred. Um, and so um, in, in studies with, with other primates in the lab and stuff, when offered two pieces of food, um, they always choose the cooked one and they will even like wait billing once once they sort of figure it out they run these experiments where basically it's like you can have raw meat right now or if you wait a little bit it'll cook and they're willing to wait a little bit which which is not something most animals will do you know um and so we've had fire for a very very long time as long as we've been a species certainly um many are now arguing about how much proto humans had fire um and and you know i, I won't go super deep into that as we continue to look for more and more um, stuff. Um, but really what we're wondering about um, is the controlled use of fire. We do know that our evolutionary ancestors were using it, but could they control it? And so, um, you know, this came about with things like, you know, a, a, a forest fire and then scavenging for animals that had been killed and quote unquote cooked uh, in those forest fires and things like that. Were we the first to have it? That's still something that we debate, but um, most likely before us, maybe Homo erectus and things like that um, may have had controlled use of fire in various places and at various times, right? But fire is very critical, okay? Uh, and as I said, this gets into our genus of Homo. And so this is actually what um, our, our, our family tree looks like. Um, you guys are going to watch a video from PBS, excellent thing that talks about the family tree and how weird and kind of strange it can be and that kind of stuff. Um, but you can see our friend with his giant head fin on the off to the side there, uh, Paranthropus, right? As I said, we do have some ancestors with them that we are not directly uh, in line with them. But this kind of messy thing that you see here is actually us. And so this is millions of years on the left-hand side there, right? It goes back to two million years. And then this is uh, across the spectrum here, uh, geographically of Africa and then into Eurasia. Um, but that you see like Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Homo erectus was sort of the the rock star of the evolutionary world i mean he was he she they they i should say um they were so well adapted that they did not change um for like a million years hardly because they were that well adapted um some of those broke off in southeast asia and kind of led to these uh, evolutionary dead ends on the far left there um floriensis um homo floriensis is the so-called hobbit that you guys may have heard about in the news a couple years ago uh things like that but on the the right side uh in africa this ultimately uh gave rise to uh heidelbergensis and ultimately homo sapiens now you'll notice that these um these lines rejoin this is uh, what we call the braided stream model which you guys will learn about in the video i mentioned so in the braided stream model what you'll notice is that these things reconnect right so for example neanderthals neanderthals were an offshoot of homo heidelbergensis that went into europe and became kind of cold weather specialists right um they did really really well in the cold you'll notice that that's that stream of neanderthals hits us well, the reason why is because I think I may have mentioned this. Um, we interbred with uh, with Neanderthals. Um, if you are uh, European, somewhere between like three and five percent of your DNA uh, potentially comes from Neanderthals. We were able to figure this out once we learned how to um, extract um, and analyze fossilized DNA and to sequence fossilized DNA. Right. Another group there that you see at the top is the Denosovans. The Denosovans are a fascinating case. Um, we literally found a bone, right? And then we found like a few finger bones in a cave in Europe. Uh, I believe it was in France. And we didn't know what the hell they were, right? And the archaeologists and, and physical anthropologists that were working there just kind of gave the bones to one of their students and was like, go study these and figure out what they are. And it turns out that they had discovered a whole new branch of humanity when we looked at it uh, from the genome standpoint. But we do know that they ultimately interbred with us as well, and Europeans have some of that. We don't have enough info about it all quite yet. Uh, but again, this, was, this is a branch that when I first started studying anthropology as an undergrad there was no such things um uh, uh from this cave site and it was not that many years ago that we went oh <laughs> you know here's the thing right you'll see also there's other kind of branches that come off and then reconnect with homo sapiens we know that looking at our our genetics 
that this has happened before, not just with Neanderthals, not just with Denosovans. It's happened before, but we don't have fossils of that yet. So we can see it in the genes, but we haven't found it in the fossil record, right? So there's still really cool, important work to be done. There's still mysteries out there for us to solve, not the bullshit history channel kind of mysteries where we need to make up things like, you know, alien autopsies and Bigfoot, uh, but cool mysteries about our own history and who we are as a species and how we got to be here uh, and, 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 you know, potentially what even comes next, right? So, um, so as I said, there's still some really cool stuff um, to see and to check out, right? This is probably the model that you're a little bit more familiar with, the kind of old school model that's like um, a tree, right? A branching tree model. Uh, and again, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just that it's a little bit misleading because it seems like um, a, a little more clean cut than it actually is. And so even if you're familiar with this, um, uh, this isn't really what we do anymore because we've come to recognize that. Uh, our evolutionary history, our genetic history is way more messy and convoluted and all of this kind of stuff, right? So, <clears throat> excuse me. You'll also see there some of the stone tool artifacts that are associated with these groups, the older one. Uh, choppers um, that were associated with uh, some of the late Australopithecines, the Ashleyan hand axes, which were associated with some of the early Homo um, uh, genus and things like that. Again, um, we tools are really important. Um, we are the only tool dependent animal on the planet. You other animals absolutely use tools, right? Chimps and bonobos and gorillas. We've seen uh, like dolphins and like crows and birds and stuff use tools, but we're the only one that can't get by without tools, right? And I should define tool here for you. A tool is anything that a human being makes, that they create, right? Um, that, that, that they manipulate an object to serve a particular function, right? So when I say tool, I'm not just talking about a screwdriver. Yeah, that's a tool, but so is a knife. So is um, a shirt, right? Um, if we live in an environment where it's too cold for us naturally, then making clothing from the hides of animals or from natural plant fibers, that's a tool as well, right? You and I die without tools. We cannot get by without tools. Fire is a tool like we were talking about, right? So tools are critically important um, in, in our adaptations, right? Uh, many years ago in the, in the 50s, 60s, there was a book that was written called Man, the tool user, right? It, the sexist language of the day being, you know, using the term man to refer to all human beings. Um, many years later, actually, a female archaeologist wrote a wonderful book called Woman, the Tool Creator. Uh, because in truth, in all the primate species, what we see, um, despite us sort of thinking of tools as manly, is that um, tool use is usually invented by females and it is always passed on by females. So the females are always the one that's doing the teaching about tools so that the next generation knows how to do it, right? All right, so we will stop there. Thank you guys very much, and I'll see you next time.